Debbie, take your Bible, go to the book of Acts. I know we're in a Sunday night series on a new creature in Christ, but I uh, want to just wrap up the Passion Week and Resurrection Sunday with this final message. I uh, don't mean final uh, in the sense of we'll never address it again, but uh, it's a wonderful week, is it not? Just to think about God loving the world and God sending Jesus to die for our sins and uh, all that took place during uh, the last week uh, chronologically in the Word of God leading up to His resurrection. And uh, so I want you to be in the book of Acts, and uh, we're going to deal tonight uh, with a uh, pretty important subject in light of the resurrection. And then immediately after the service, we'll have a time together uh, to reflect on the broken body and the blood of our Lord with a uh, time at the supper table together. So I'm looking forward to about the next 30, 40 minutes. Acts chapter number one, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your kindness and your compassion. Bless now the preaching of the word of God and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Look in verse number one. Acts chapter number one, verse number one. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me that promise in Acts 1 verse 4 is Luke 24 49 when Jesus said but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high look in verse number five it all started with John declaring behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world did it not so look in verse 5 John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom, restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. I want you to look in verse number 11, where the Bible says, the two men said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. I'm probably in this auditorium the most unique individual. I'm different. My wife would say, I'm odd. 
<clears throat> I wouldn't debate that. That's probably true. I love the History Channel. I love to study history. I love to study science. I love politics. In short, I'm a nerd. <laughs> I love these things that other people don't like. I like peculiar things in the Word of God. I like to read the Word of God. I like the Word of God to feed me. I like the Word of God to lead me. But there are just some things in the Word of God that attract my attention. I don't know if they do you, but they certainly do me. In fact, Brother Jason, by the time I am done reading my Bible, I'm not bragging, I'm just letting you know I read 10 chapters of the Word of God every day. That allows me to read my Bible through four times a year, which means every four months I'm going to reread that which I have already read, and by the time I'm done, I generally have more questions than I did the time before, or I'm intrigued by something more than I was before. And I was attracted while reading Acts chapter number 1, where the Bible says the two men in verse 10, in verse 11, ask the question, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? And then my mind went back over the last 40 days. This is the third time in a 40-day period that an angelic being has posed a question to humanity. And I just find that interesting. Two men in the book of Luke, chapter 24 and verse number 5 said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? You get to the end of the book of John. Mary's in the garden. The Bible says in chapter 20, verse 13, that two angelic beings asked her, Why weepest thou? And then you come to the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 11, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now that may not be of interest to you. It certainly is interesting to me because as I said before while preaching in this church that questions if my mind is correct from my days in grammar school demand answers so let's go back to why seek ye the living among the dead because the resurrection is difficult for the human mind to comprehend do not try to comprehend the resurrection. Believe it by faith. Amen. Up from the grave he arose. I can't explain it. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The Bible says that on the cross he gave up the ghost. That means his heart stopped pumping the blood. That means his brain ceased to function. I'm talking about his humanity because God... The Son of God was the Son of Man. He was as much human as we are human, except without the sin nature. He passed away. He died. He gave up the ghost. He was buried, just like I buried my mother, just like we buried her mother, just like we buried my wife's father, just like you buried your family and friends. They're in the ground waiting for their body to be reunited with their soul. They have ceased to dwell on the earth. For you and I to walk by a cemetery and think, that someone is capable of resurrecting from the dead is a little bit beyond our humanity. So the disciples literally look in that tomb and the angel said, why seek ye the living among the dead? You seek the dead among the dead. He told you he was going to resurrect. He did resurrect. You're in the wrong place. The next, the next statement, Brother Curtis, in verse 6 is, He is not here, He's risen. You're in the wrong place. 
That's why they were asking the question to remind the disciples you're in the wrong place. And I think it's also meaning this. You did not listen to him. You didn't believe him. He's not here. He said that and he's risen. Then you get to John 20. Why weepest thou, Mary? I think that's an honest question. Because I think what God is trying to show us 2,000 years later is the bond that Mary had with Jesus, a perfectly appropriate Christian bond. I would submit to you that Mary, not Paul, may be the greatest New Testament example of true Christianity. If not, they're tied. And I'll tell you why. Because she learned the value of sitting at his feet. She realized that her sister thought life was about service. Mary realized the balance between study and service. And why weepest thou? But the angelic host, and even Jesus, who in the next verse would say, why weepest thou? Very interesting that the two angels and Jesus were in proximity one of the other. But don't you remember that from the Old Testament when he went down to Sodom and Gomorrah? Jesus, two angels were with Abraham before Abraham communed with God and the two angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, he's saying, what are you weeping over? There's nothing to cry about. You cry when someone is dead. You rejoice when someone is alive. When my mother died, I wept tears of grief. When I was born, my mother wept tears of joy. Now that's what she told me anyway. <laughs> I about said she also wept tears of grief, but she didn't. <laughs> we weep tears of joy at the birth of a precious baby, and we weep tears of grief when a loved one or a friend has departed. The angelic beings and Jesus himself is not necessarily rebuking Mary, but trying to draw her attention, you're weeping over nothing. So the two angels tell the disciples, you're in the wrong place. The angels are telling Mary, you're in the wrong mood. They're trying to say compassionately, brighten up. He's not here. He's not dead. Then you come to Acts chapter number one. Now, I don't know how you are. I try to put myself into a Bible setting. I can just imagine them being on the Mount of Olives. I can just imagine them hearing Jesus teach and giving them commandments, preparing to ascend. And I can imagine, Brother Jason, that just in the middle of all of this, he begins to ascend. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible says, while he was talking with them, he began to go up. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Can't you see him? I think they watched him all the way out of their sight. And two angelic beings said, why stand you here gazing? Now here, here, here's what, they, what they're trying to correct. He's coming back. You're staring off into space like your best friend. And he is the friend that's thinking closer than a brother. And your redeemer. And he is the savior of the world. And your very own brother. And he is. If you're saved, you're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're, you and I are brothers and sisters with him. 
You're acting as though you'll never see him again. Why stand ye here gazing? In other words, didn't you hear what Jesus just said? Lift up your eyes in the fields, they're white unto harvest. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. If I go, I'll come again. Hey, he's given you promises. He's given you commandments. He's given you an admonition. He's been taken from you. Quit worrying about if the kingdom's going to be restored and get about our Father's business. Yeah. Mary, you're in the wrong mood. Disciples, you're in the wrong place. And then he says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? I want to submit to you that our risen Savior is returning soon. He's telling them you're in the wrong mind frame. You are acting as if he left never to return when in reality he left to return. And our risen Savior, because the Bible says in verse number three, after his passion by many infallible proofs, didn't P, uh, Paul deal with that in 1 Corinthians 15? He was seen of Paul. He was seen of witnesses. He was seen of the disciples. Forty days Jesus has remained on the earth since his resurrection. <laughs> He's going to go, and 10 days later, equaling Pentecost, they're going to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. He's resurrected from the dead. He's trying to tell them, look, I'm rising, but I'm returning. In John chapter 14, you've heard me quote this. You can quote this yourself. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. In 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And then John closes up the Bible in Revelation 22 by saying, Jesus proclaimed, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Now, I want your mind to go back to the Old Testament. If I could do this for just a minute, I won't preach long. I'm not going to promise that because every time I do, I preach long. But I'm going to attempt to be brief tonight and get us to focus in on what the prophet Amos said in chapter 4, verse 12, prepare to meet thy God because our risen Savior is returning soon be ready now let me give you three things to consider number one it's an absolute reality he went and he's coming he left and he's returning it's an absolute reality that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. These two angelic beings declared emphatically that this same, not a different, but this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. It's an absolute reality. What is that, Brother Sam? Chapter 4, verse 12, prepare to meet by God. When he returns, there's a meeting time. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 9, Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There are a few words in there I want to pull out. Number one is exalted. Jesus is exalted. Number two, the word every. Every knee is bowing 
to the exalted one. Not some, not most. Every, 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 every knee is going to bow. By the way, he said of things in heaven and of things in the earth, every angel is going to bow. I believe personally the demons of hell are going to bow. I believe every human that has ever existed is going to bow. I believe the planets are going to bow. I believe the animal kingdom is going to bow. I believe everything in heaven, everything in earth is going to fall prostrate before a thrice holy God and say, worthy, worthy, worthy. God denier, you're going to stand before God. Doubtful believer, you're going to stand before God. Disobedient believer, you're going to stand before God. Defiant individual, you're going to stand before God. Rich, you're going to stand before God. Poor, you're going to stand before God. Educated, you're standing before God. Uneducated, you're standing before God. Heads of state, presidents, queens, kings, those that have been in authority will bow to the authority one day. Amen. It's an absolute reality. This absolute reality deals firstly with the sinner. Sinner, you're going to bow. The Bible says your place of bowing will be at the great white throne of judgment. That's where you will meet God. Prepare to meet thy God. Sinner friend, I saw a great white throne. If you die and your name's not found in the book of life, you're standing at the great white throne. That's where you're meeting God only to be removed from God. As he said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Saint, you're going to stand before God at a place called the judgment seat of Christ. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all, that and Paul's talking to believers, we must all, every believer will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to happen there, Brother Sam? You're going to give an account of those things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. The result, wood, hay, stubble. The result, gold, silver, and precious stones. The sinner at the great white throne judgment is going to meet God in relationship to their soul. But the saint that meets God at the judgment seat of Christ is going to meet God in relationship to their life and service. Can I just tell you something, friend? There is a whole lot more that happens after you're dead than while you're alive. I'm trying to say you and I are going to revisit these days. You don't live, you don't die, and then move on into eternity as if nothing happened. That's not the way it works, friend. We're going to stand before a thrice holy God. It's an absolute reality. Number two, I want you to observe a risen Savior. A risen Savior is returning soon. Be ready. I want you to consider the admonition rendered. There's an admonition, and that is prepare to meet. Do you see how we're going backwards in this phrase? There's an absolute reality. Prepare to meet thy God. There's an admonition rendered. Prepare to meet. Get ready for it. The Bible says in Luke 12, 40, Be ye ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. He's not only telling you you're going to stand before God, he's admonishing you to get ready to meet by God. I thought we had a pretty successful anniversary, didn't you? We didn't just sit down on a Friday night before March the 17th and concoct that whole weekend. In fact, before I ever came, 
when you all had called me, I accepted the call. I realized one of the main events of the church would be the 39th anniversary. Pastor would be the pastor emeritus, Brother Kerbis. I knew some things needed to be take, uh, uh, taking place in short order. We only had a few months to get ready. Guests needed to be invited. There were some special things we did without his knowledge. Maybe not. I don't know. He seems to know a lot, but we did our best to, to try to provide some things that were special. We, we had the reality of the date coming, so there was an admonition, there was a rendering of preparation. Had a good Easter, I thought. We've been visiting. You ladies were cooking. I was praying. I was studying. You were inviting. We were preparing our auditorium, which held almost 120 people today by the grace of God. You just don't watch things happen. You have to get ready. So he's given us an admonition. He said, you better prepare to meet. Have I told you this story when my mom was a school teacher and my brother and I would pray? No, look at your faces. You're like, every single person, starting with Brother Vern, went, <laughs> apparently I've told you that two or three times <laughs> so because I love you I'm not going to recapitulate that particular story I'm just trying to tell you there's an admonition rendered be ready as I've told you on numerous occasions I wasn't I wasn't ready when my wife and I became engaged a great day in her life and in mine. I realize that now she's going to be with me by the grace of God for the rest of our natural lives. And it's not her responsibility to run the home, provide for the home. It's my responsibility, so I better prepare. And a long time before we ever gave our vows one to the other, the day we were married, we already had an apartment lined up. We had to be ready. I couldn't just get married, take her back to Mastin, Ohio for my final year of Bible college and say, um, well, will you call the local KOA and see if they have a hookup for the night? I got to go find us a place to live. No, that, that didn't work. We already had a place to live long before we ever recited our vows. I had a job, she had a job. We had a course of action for my final year of Bible college. Why? Uh, we had to prepare to wed. Haven't you noticed that we do everything in life we prepare for it except for the greatest event that's going to happen and that's standing before God? We don't seem to put much preparation into that, do we? We prepare to see each other. We prepare for our family reunions. We prepare for our church activities. Don't you think we ought to prepare to meet him? Because it's an absolute reality that we're going to. So the admonition rendered is prepare to meet. Hey, the advice is get ready. Our risen Savior is returning soon. Well, that leads to the third point. Can you believe that? I'm embarrassed. I'm been preaching 15 minutes and I'm on my final point, but I have three sub points under that point. <laughs> I don't want you to get too happy. Number one, well, let me let me give you the word prepare. That that's there's an act, action required. You just don't come to an awareness that you need to prepare, Brother Jason, and then do nothing about it. The day I got married, I realized it's Saturday morning, June the 21st. I don't know if she and I had even discussed it, but why did we pick the longest day of the year? Hot. We're newlyweds in a car with no air conditioning. But that's okay because it's a beautiful summer day and we'll just roll the windows down. There wasn't a cloud in the sky the day we got married. I say I do, she says I do. We peck on the mouth and a storm is brewing. <laughs> we walk outside and it's as gray of a summer night storm as it can be. 
Now, have you ever tried to drive in a 1994 Taurus thunderstorm with no air conditioning and you can't crack the windows? It tested every fiber of what just took place a few hours ago. I'll tell you that right now. But it was in the morning time, and I realized this is my wedding day. Yeah, I probably better shower, probably better shave, probably better get my suit on, this tuxedo. And then my mother shows up, and she gives me a boutonniere the size of a palm tree, and it's sticking up here right by my... And then you know how I wear pocket squares, so she thought that she should have two or three pocket squares of two or three various colors and shoves them down in my suit. I feel like I'm walking to the altar with a tent. <laughs> Prepare. She prepared. She beautified herself. Didn't take long. <laughs> I'm dumb. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I'm not blind. What are you saying, Brother Sam? Well, if we realized there was an activity coming, then that took action. You just don't say, hmm, he's coming again. I probably should be ready and then not do what it takes to get ready. In other words, don't talk about getting ready. Get ready. There's an action required. Let me give you the three actions. Number one, look for them. The Bible says in Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. June the 21, when we got engaged, that date was circled, and I looked forward to becoming husband to Wendy. She became my wife. It was a day to look forward to. Don't you think his return's a day to look forward to? Yeah. How should I prepare, Brother Sam? Look for it. Because when you look for it, you'll, number two, live for it. Where you look changes how you live. If you're looking to the world, you're going to live like the world. If you're looking to riches, you're going to live for riches. If you're looking for popularity, you're going to live for popularity and fame and fortune. If you're looking to live for yourself, you're or looking to yourself, you're going to live for yourself. Didn't the Bible say, Brother Jason, about Demas, he looked to this present world, so he departed for this present world. But if you look for him to come and you look for your meeting with him, then you'll live for him. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.11, the context is in the return of the Lord. He said, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation? That is lifestyle and godliness. Not only look for him, live for him. I don't want to be ashamed of his coming. I don't want to be where I shouldn't be when he comes. I don't want to be doing what I shouldn't be doing when he comes. I don't want to be wearing I shouldn't be wearing when he comes. I don't want to be talking like I shouldn't be talking when he comes. And, and I surely don't want to be out of the house of God when he comes. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad you're here? I mean that. I pray unless I'm working sick or dead, I'm praying there's not an opportunity that the doors to the church of God are open and a saint saved by his grace doesn't have enough God to take him there. Labor for him. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 when it talks about this immortality, uh, this uh, mortality, putting on immortality, talks about being changed in the twinkling of an eye, talks about the Lord coming back to get his saints. He then says this, Brother Curvis, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said in verse 8 of our text, chapter 1, book of Acts, he said you'll receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. Get into the field that Jesus already told them is white unto harvest. The Bible says we're going to give an account of not only how we lived, but how we labored. It is required in stewards. Read the context. It's talking about those 
entrusted with the gospel, that they be found faithful. <coughs> well, it's good to talk about a risen Savior. Don't forget he's returning soon. We better be ready, prepared on this resurrection Sunday to meet our God. It's an absolute reality. You're going to stand before God. There's an admonition rendered. Prepare to meet thy God. There's an action required. It's that one word, prepare. Do something about it. I believe we prepare by looking for him. Where you look determines how you live. Live for him. Labor for him. Are you prepared when he returns to meet our risen Savior? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.